Hello and happy Thanksgiving. We are pleased to bring you this broadcast of highlights from the opening pair of programs of our Connective Harmony 15th anniversary season. You will experience the world premiere performances of newly commissioned works by acclaimed composers Wang Ji and Afghan composer and performer Humayun Saki, as well as the American premiere of a new string quartet by Turkish composer Erbrook Arielmaz. Panel discussions with our artist collaborators led by Sinjin Flynn and Fred Child, host of American Public Media's performance today, illuminate and breathe contextual life into these new works of art. During this season of giving, please consider a gift to Apollo in support of our innovative multicultural commissioning, educational programs, and expansive community projects like Library Voyage. Our fundraising goal to close the year boldly is $20,000. We are so grateful for the opportunity to create new music and art meaningfully connected to the world in which we live. I wish to extend a special heartfelt thanks to Apollo's board of directors and to one of our founding board members, C. Howard Pieper, whose legacy gift provided the seed money for our first commissioning endeavors and projects. His generosity almost a decade ago laid the foundation for Apollo's growth and success and continues to inspire our multicultural and musical explorations. We begin the program with music by Sergei Prokofiev, a work he wrote in exile from his home country prior to his music being banned and his wife thrown into a Soviet prison camp gulag in 1948. Here is the second movement from his first string quartet, equal parts playfully mischievous, sarcastic, and wonderfully engaging.
going to travel for something very different than the Prokofiev. We're going to travel to Turkey. Um, some of you may know Erbrook Erilmaz, a fantastic composer uh, in 2014, um, almost 10 years ago now. He won our first commissioning contest when we just were starting to do commissioning. We had over 250 entries from 36 countries and 36 states all over the world. And uh, he was our, our winner. He wrote this really fabulous piece that's on our second album, Blurred Boundaries, if you want to check it out, um, called Thracian Airs of SMA Sultan. He then came to do schooling at, the, at Rice University to get his doctorate at the Shepherd School. And uh, then he found his calling in 2020 during the pandemic. He was invited back to Ankara, his, own, his home city, to start a music school connecting Western classical and Turkish folk music. So, Erbrook, we love you. We miss you here in Houston. But he, uh, he did a premiere, um, I think, last year, and uh, this, this is a really wonderful, wonderful piece he's going to introduce um, via satellite. Hello, everyone in Houston. I wish I could be there with you. Um, really, thanks to Apollo for uh, playing this piece. Uh, it will be uh, the first time this piece is getting uh, performed in the United States. I wrote this piece recently for a quartet in, uh, in Turkey, in Istanbul. Um, the piece is uh, for the memory of uh, this incredible violinist from Western Black Sea region. His name is Bolulu Amar Rasim. He was a blind violinist, incredible musician. Um, if we look at the music of this, it's uh, you can see a trace of like how um, groups of people moved uh, throughout Turkey. So you see this similar style in musically from the Western Black Sea coast to. Mediterranean coast. It's really interesting. Um, but there's something really weirdly interesting about um, this style of music and it is uh, how it is accompanied uh, by dance. Um, so during, during Ottoman time, um, Muslim women they were not allowed to uh, dance. And so, um, but people love belly dancing. So that gave an idea that um, men uh, dress up uh, similarly to how women were dressing up at that time, and they would dance um, um, with uh, symbols um, attached to their clothes. So it has this dancing has uh, like percussive elements um, that uh, supports music, and it's also interesting. Oh. Prohibition of um, women dancing um, created this weird, interesting dance um, that was done by men. And the music is, the original folk music of the region is really interesting. And I was so inspired and I wrote this piece. I hope you guys like the piece. Thank you so much.
serve on the board of directors of the Apollo Chamber Players. And tonight's performance is titled Band Music. And it's perhaps very appropriate that we are here in the uh, Holocaust Museum, Houston. Entata Musik, or degenerate music, was what the Nazi government of Germany called music it considered harmful or decadent, music that was anti-German. And in the 1930s, we know what that meant. The Nazis wanted to create a purified national cultural identity, one that was purged of degenerate Jewish and foreign influences. In 1933, the Nazis established the Reich Chamber of Music, which encouraged government-sanctioned music, forcibly removed Jewish musicians from any official posts, and banned the playing of Jewish compositions. As we will see and hear this evening, music, art, and culture are still restricted in many areas of the world as extremist factions attempt to stifle the voices of their opponents. Apollo is very pleased this evening to partner with several nonprofit organizations. This concert is a prelude to Compassionate Houston's Compassion Week and World Kindness Day. This is an international observance to help understand that compassion for others is what binds us all together. A portion of tonight's proceeds will be split between the Holocaust Museum and Connect Community, a local nonprofit that supports career education, health and wellness, affordable housing, and economic vitality for immigrants and refugees in the Gulfton, Sharpstown neighborhood of Houston. Let me introduce the people up here on stage with me. Firstly, we have Rababa Husseini, who is uh, an Afghani refugee, and she is involved with Connect Community. We have Humayun Saki, who is an Afghan Rubab. Did I pronounce that correctly? Thank you. My Afghani is good. <laughs> Afghani Rubab virtuoso. He's also the composer of the Apollo Commission, the world premiere of which we will hear this evening. And then Shantilal Shah, who is a classical Indian tablet player. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce somebody who perhaps needs no introduction, but demands one anyway. <laughs> the executive director and violinist of the Apollo Chamber Players, Matthew Dietrich. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you all so much for being here this evening. It's wonderful to see a full house. Uh, for this program. I think you know this program aligns very well with the Holocaust Museum's mission and Apollo's mission to connect communities and cultures through globally inspired music and our vision to create cultural harmony through musical exploration. So with that as a basis, a little bit more specifically, um, I happened to find myself in the summer of 2021 in August during the fall of Kabul, driving to Arkansas. I was in the car for about nine hours for a film festival. And uh, I was listening to the news coverage um, and knew how, you know, sense how devastating it was then and how devastating it would be. So, you know, we've always been interested in this, you know, this fertile connection between Western classical music and traditional music of, of every culture. And we'd never done anything with an Afghani performer. So I uh, remember, I, you know, I, during that drive, I remember hearing a Humayun uh, at the Asia Society, Texas in 2019. It seems like another era right before the pandemic. Um, the fall of 2019 and was entranced by his musicianship and virtuosity and I uh, contacted him shortly thereafter and we you know, put together um, an idea for this program while well, we you know, kind of weaving together this thread that this could be in a larger discussion of, of, of prohibited music and banned music um, from, uh, from other cultures as well. Um, so that's sort of the genesis of this particular program. When I was a, when I was a boy we would take in refugees from different uh, countries I believe we had two refugees from China uh, for a number of months, um, and then also from Africa for a while. And you know, I think that that, that that kind of instilled in me this idea of compassion and service towards other others, and um, kind of still inspires the programming of Apollo uh, to this day. Well, we saw Rababa in the video. Welcome. Thank you so much, and it's my pleasure that uh, I am here this evening with you guys. Mm. I am Baba Husseini and I am from Afghanistan. I came in uh, Houston, uh, Texas, like uh, 
in uh, 2019, August. And um, I start my work with Connect Community since last year. Uh, first, I start with the uh, embroidery with the Red, Collect uh, Red Thread Collective, and then uh, I start my working uh, in English classes. Just uh, they need for uh, my Afghan uh, uh, friends, they need for translation. Just I help uh, uh, them with the in translation and in English class and in uh, uh, sewing class and in different parts that they need. Uh, so I also want to continue my work with Connect Community and uh, help uh, the refugees and other peoples that come in uh, <coughs> um, uh, in United States and they are new, real new, and they need for help. And I, it's my pleasure and I, I will try my best to help them. Now, as, as Matt mentioned, um, Kabul fell to the Taliban yes. in 2021. Um, how has that affected people's lives in Afghanistan? Actually, mm, it's uh, affected very bad uh, for all people that uh, they are living under the rule of Taliban, especially ladies, especially women. And right now, as you guys know, that uh, it's, uh, they can't, the school are closed for women, for girls. They can't study, they can't continue their schools because uh, Taliban is uh, closed all high schools for girls. And uh, music, we can't listen music in our homes. If we uh, play music by a, a loud label, man, loud William, they, maybe they come and they arrest the people. Why are you listening to music? It's unlawful and uh, we never let the people to listen to music. And this is, it's, it's a hard situation, it's a hard situation. And uh, it's, I, I'm really, I really worry about uh, my people, about my um, uh, uh, homeland. Uh, we turned like um, 20 years in past, in past, and we start from, we have to start from beginning. And uh, right now, it's it's not a good situation, especially for women. Then they can't go uh, alone uh, outside. If they can, they go outside alone. Oh. Where's your brother? Where's your husband? You have to come out with your brother, with your husband, or with your father. Uh, you, you're not allowed to come alone. If you want to come uh, outside, you have to full cover. You have to uh, wear uh, socks. You have to wear scarves. And um, many other things that they, uh, they have to do because of Taliban. They lost their uh, freedom, especially ladies, especially women. What about your future in the U.S.? Oh, I, I think I have a bright future. As, as uh, everybody know that it's the land of opportunity, land of opportunity, yes. And uh, I saw a bright future for me and for my family, especially for my daughters and my son, that they start school from here, they start their school from here, and uh, they have a bright future. And for me too, my all other Afghan friends that they are refugees in here, all of them, I think, they have a bright future in here. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and let's turn on to uh, Hamayun Saki. Yes. The first question I have for you, because uh, I have, I must admit, I know nothing about your instrument, the rubat. Would you introduce that? Of course. We're using uh, normally three strings. Uh, like the main strings we call uh, Jalautar, Mianatar, and Katatar. It's like uh, uh, before was gut they use, and now we're using uh, uh, nylon. And then this rubab I made uh, especially for like quartet and jazz, and sometimes like uh, for extra uh, four strings. Mm -hmm. And then I have a two. Uh, short arts drone, and then 15 sympathetic strings. Okay. Yeah. Did you say you made this? No, I didn't. No, you didn't. No, no. There's those starts like, you know, some people there. Were, 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 is, that, is that something that you can only get in Afghanistan? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. And this also here is goats. We are using goat skin. And then this is we call harag, means like donkey. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about, about Aman. I don't know if I'm 
the name of your piece Arman. is Arman. Arman. Arman means like hope. And then I, I composed this piece, especially, especially the situation we have in Afghanistan right now. And then that's why it's, you know, it's, I think it's tough for all Afghans, but also for musicians, because like right now in Afghanistan, it's, you know, there's not a lot. All musicians, they, 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 they moved from Afghanistan to Iran, Pakistan, and uh, India, or, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, everywhere, America, and in different countries. We don't have right now, we don't have music in Afghanistan. Well, Shantilal, you play the tabla. Yes. Is that an instrument? You, no, it's a, primarily identified with India, but is that an instrument that can be found in Afghanistan as well? Yeah, they say that this origin, there's so many different, different stories about this instrument. That they say there's one, this instrument came from Afghanistan, they have relation with the Afghanistan, this instrument. So they, they used to call, they called tabal that time. The tabal, uh, the instrument name, they become tabla. So there's so many stories, but we, we share Afghanistan and India. Music wise, we're very similar kind of same classical music, very wonderful music and very old tradition music we share, share with uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan. The musical traditions that, that you come from are not traditions of written music, are they? Yeah. So how has it been for you, Homeo, to actually have to include a string quartet where, unfortunately, they, they do like it to be written down? <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, uh, in Afghanistan, we have also like uh, notes we call like Sare uh, Gama Padani which is like in India and in Afghanistan, they're using both the same, like uh, also the tabla, like da, di, like da, tin, some uh, others, I think 12 or how many? Yeah, 12, 12 16 celebrants, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, the, and then, yeah, when, uh, when my f father, he teach me, he teach me like my note, like, but on own, like Sare Gama Padani like raga, basic stuff. So there, there are some sort of fundamentals that, yeah. that you build the, yeah. the music we start like I start with classic, you know? That's a little bit of the, of the challenge in, when we do combine uh, Western classical music that's notated with traditional music. And you did such a wonderful job, um, you. and you're you know, the, the, your, your publisher um, is an immaculate score, pretty much. And uh, during our rehearsals, you know, for those musicians out here, um, we know where we are. Oh, let's start from letter B or letter C. Um, and then we just have to eventually just sing the tune and, and they would know exactly where we are. <laughs> That's not in, in practice. And Chantalal here, just, he, we just started rehearsing just a few days ago and he got right into the groove. Without note. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really a pleasure for us to perform this piece for you and a pleasure to perform with these wonderful, incredible musicians um, and for you, our wonderful audience. So. Give them a round of applause. Thank you very much.
My name is Fred Child. I host a radio show called Performance Today, which is on public radio stations around the country. And I'm tremendously lucky that I get to share with music lovers coast to coast great concert performances from all across the country and around the world on a daily basis. It's really special for me to be in Houston because there are so many musical organizations in Houston that are world-class and whose work we are happy to share on our show. And there are many folks here tonight, actually. Uh, John from the Houston Symphony is here tonight and other folks from the Houston Symphony. It's a pleasure of mine to share the Houston Symphony recordings on our show. Rocco, formerly known as the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra. Uh, the Shepherd School of Music, Matthew from the Shepherd School of Music is here. Andrew Stopey, pianist, is here. Uh, as well, and of course the Apollo Chamber players. So Houston is a frequent stop on our on our musical trips on my on my daily radio program. This evening in itself is kind of a celebration of the richness of the Houston scene. So it's a tremendous pleasure for me to be here. Uh, this is really an auspicious day. It's a full moon. Matt mentioned earlier that today is the day of the annual Mid-Autumn Festival, the Moon Festival, uh, big in Chinese culture and the other Asian cultures as well. Um, we're here with the Apollo Chamber Players, whose name comes at least in part from the spirit of adventure and exploration of the Apollo Project. And Wang Ji and I went to the Space Center today and I just want to share that that was especially meaningful for me. I was born in Huntsville, Alabama, because my father worked for Boeing in the 1960s and was one of the engineers working on creating and building the Saturn V booster rocket. And my father passed away when I was very young, and today was the first time I was in the presence of a Saturn V booster rocket. And uh, to see what was the handiwork of so many people, including my father, and to be in the presence of that was quite a meaningful experience for me today. And we also saw a film at the Space Center, and of course the astronauts are talking about looking down at the Earth. You don't see borders between countries. Uh, there's a real sense of the, the oneness, the wholeness of the Earth, and Matt Dietrich, I've always had the impression that that was part of the founding principle of the Apollo Chamber Players. Yes, thank you, Fred. And actually, I believe that term is, is uh, called the overview effect. I think, Fred, your, your idea of a borderless world is a good one. And I think that th yeah, through music, we can connect with people in ways that are, are more meaningful. And um, I, th I think people can latch on, especially in a global city like Houston, to the good of, of of different cultures, um, and that's what we try to express through our music. For myself, 
living and working in, in Houston, Space City. This is, this is what I am meant to be doing at Apollo Chamber of Players. We're so you know, proud to be representing the best parts of, of the city. And speaking of that sense of exploration, we've heard in the first half, uh, Daryl played this incredible new piece for solo organ. We, we heard two pieces for string quartet. The organ has a history going back 2,300 years and an incredible history in Western liturgical music, of course, and more recently in concert music. The string quartet has been one of the core ensembles of Western classical music for a good three centuries now. But generally speaking, never the twain have met. So to boldly go where no one has gone before, <laughs> Wang Ji, what, what was the idea and how has it been putting together organ and string quartet in the piece that we'll hear in the second half? So the only honest way I can say this is that uh, I, I've, uh, I write a lot of symphonic and operatic um, work, so, so my sensibilities are tend to gravitate towards the larger forces, the symphony orchestras and the, the, the opera theater. Um, and so due to the power of projection, which all of us share, by the way, uh, when I see a string quartet, when I hear a string quartet, I hear an orchestra in the string quartet. And then when I, uh, I'm also an organist, so I'm biased to love the instrument, and, and, and I, uh, I think I feel and understand the, the potential and the expressive potential and the capability of this orchestral instrument, which, you know, it's literally an orchestra. This is an orchestra. There's, there's uh, Daryl, maybe you can tell us how many pipes. Uh, usually it's up to thousands of pipes that are behind here. Yeah, I think so. there's probably a little over 5,000 pipes up behind mm -hmm. all of that. So. And that's pretty, that's, that's like a, this is a very significant concert instrument. So it's very different from the service instruments that we uh, we tend to hear from uh, church services uh, and the instrument that I practice on. So this you will hear Daryl today and his uh, in orchestration. These are all organists' interpretation of the notes. Uh, I didn't really put in any indication for Daryl what are the instrument and moments of these recipes that Daryl actually discovered through learning uh, this new work. So um, to put these two together, I, uh, I think of it as sort of a concerto for string quartet and a concerto for organ, but at the same time. I, I feel like words are not able to catch up with the with the imagination that um, took over my, uh, my inspiration at some point, it's like, oh, this space is so mysterious. Let me just find out what kind of outrageous thing that I could, <laughs> I could come up with. So this is my very best attempt at a combination that is so exciting and so new, and uh, it's full of uh, new uh, possibilities. It's a 20 minute piece essentially in one long gesture. There are not movement breaks in the piece. And Daryl, as the organist, this presents some special challenges for you. I mean, Wang Ji talked about choosing the registrations. That means choosing the sounds for each section of the piece. That's one thing. But as we saw in the first half, you literally have your back facing out. So you can't see the musicians you're playing with in the quartet. How has this experience been for you? Yeah, I mean, um, luckily here we're able to get fairly close so I can catch a few glimpses out of the corner of my eye. But a lot of it, uh, I think you described the other day, is sort of the feeling like when someone walks up behind you, there's sort of this synergy that is created by collaborative music making that's really exciting and really um, effective. And so we're able to do that uh, in this piece and hold things together um, in a really unique way. Organ, of course, collaborates a lot with vocal music. We do a lot of choral and, and uh, congregational and solo rep. Um, but to work with fabulous string players and other instrumentalists is such a treat uh, to really do that really high level of chamber music. So, I mean, this is a real treat to be able to get to do this because it's way outside of the norm. Quickly, but just before we break, G, um, a little bit about the title, for one thing. And I also want to talk about the influences of Indian classical music. But the title, The Night When You See Again. Um, I think 
I think the title, if I, if I tell you where the title and where, when the title come, it's a PR nightmare. Um, because the piece came to me first. And, and then I was almost, I, I was almost done uh, with the larger stuff in the piece and then coming down to the details. And then, then I was scratching my head. It's still without a title. But I already start to like the piece, and I like the way that it uh, it just expands, expands, it explores and explores. It's almost a sense of that migration that is in the uh, body of all of us. This is the foundation of our species. We migrated from the African savanna, and our species, this sense of migration, this sense of movement, this sense of motion, it is in all of us, and this is the common ground, and our sense of time is, is intricately tied to the fabric of time that is our universe. And so this piece is sort of me wondering out loud what it's like to live from moment to moment in the fabric of time. And it so just happened that Louis Glick's uh, poem collection arrived from Amazon, <laughs> and then I just leafed through it, and my thumb chose this poem. And the poem, The Night When You See Again, uh, it describes, of course, you know, the poetry is so beautiful, I'm not going to ruin it for you. But the sensibility of it is that there's so much migration and immigration that happens that your eyes are unable to see because it happens silently and it sometimes ha happens in the darkness. But when you hear someone, when you actually use your ears and you can hear all of the migration, all of the history. So it's almost like a catch up game. Why is it that for me as a musician, as, as a composer, my, my, my eyes are always struggling to catch up with my ear and I'm always listening for something that is more real to me than what my eyes are telling me. And this brings me to the core of something I've been exploring as an artist is what is the, what is the connection between people who don't share the same face, don't share the same faith, and do not share the same uh, background. And, and that's the question that I've been wondering out loud through this piece. We could dive into great detail about some of the technical aspects of the piece, but I'll just mention that, uh, Ji, I know you're a, a serious student of Indian classical dance because you and I take lessons together in a dance form called Bharatanatyam, which is from the South Indian tradition. And you're a tremendous fan of Indian classical music. And Indian classical music literally has a different scale than what we're used to as, as Western music lovers. And there are some notes that are kind of in between the notes. So Daryl has an organ, which has 12 notes to an octave. Um, but there are some string writing that Ji has done for this piece that calls for notes like between E and E flat. What's E half flat or quarter flat or three quarters flat, three quarters sharp, one quarter sharp. So there are some notes in the strings that might seem to be out of tune to our Western ears, but in fact, they're just based on a different system. Can, Matt, can you show us a little bit of? So I'll, I'll first say that uh, this is not what you're taught when you're young. And my mother, who's in the audience, did not teach me this for good reason, but it's so fascinating to explore all these microtones and quarter tones between half steps. This is B, the note B. Now what would you like me to play? A quarter flat. A quarter flat. In the context of the, the good intonation that our Western ears has been tuned to, so every culture 
in the world heritage of music. We all, we all discovered overtone series and we all understand there's this octave and then there's these partials and every culture has discovered this. This is a gift from nature. And so every culture has, our, uh, has their own understanding of how to divide an octave. For us, it's 12 notes and more or less equal. Not really, you know, there's, there's no such thing as actually equal. Uh, division of the octave into 12. But in some cultures, in, in the culture, for example, in, uh, in Chinese, in some regions of China, five notes and they're having a party. They don't need any more. Uh, and they just kind of shuffle it through. Um, and uh, then in Indian classical, um, they, they, depending on who you talk to, they have between 22 to 27, 28 notes in an octave. And once they get into these between notes, they also have all of the notes we have, but once they get into these notes that they, they call the colors, they, the raga, they call the scales ragas, it's basically a way to paint your mind. So once these notes are hit in a very tasteful way, it takes decades to even be tasteful in, in capturing these notes, it releases all the flavors in the sound. Living in New York City for the last 20 something years, having uh, immigrated from Shanghai, which you know makes New York kind of feel mellow. It's, um, and so I am at the intersection of so many different cultures, you know, Afro-Cuban, like I have neighbors are Dominican Republican and Puerto Rican, and I lived in all kinds of different neighborhoods and traveled to, you know, there's, there's everything in New York City and what it means, and there's also the United Nation. So I feel like I, being a living composer today in 21st century, I feel like I'm the United Nation of musical culture. I can, I get to be the United Nation of Musical Cultures. And I get to, uh, when I work, I get to be at a position where all of these influences becomes part of me. Um, and in the spirit of James Baldwin, I would like to say that uh, the, the truth for me about diversity is actually from inside out. I think for me, the most important thing is that I can expand my perspectives to be able to embrace all of the different peoples that live in my city and live in this world and live in the United States. And once I can expand my perspectives, that's where I can begin to create works that would resonate with the diversity of the audience. And that is the reality of living in the United States today, living in today's musical culture, different age, different, different uh, immigrants, different communities, and different uh, musical background. Uh, so it's a very exciting time uh, to be a living composer today. And, and I'm very grateful that all of you come out tonight to support a world premiere. It really means the world to me.